Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Patrick Brennan of National Review is in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives as usual. And it was a big day yesterday up on Capitol Hill, Patrick, and that'll kind of encompass our good and bad martinis, starting with the good. The House Oversight Committee had some entertaining testimony yesterday. They had Jonathan Gruber, uh, the man whose videos we saw Day after day after day, literally from uh, mostly 2012, 2013, saying things like Obamacare was not written in a transparent way. So uh, we could slip it past the stupidity of the American voter. We had to write the bill in a tortured way so that uh, it was not actually thought of as a tax when it comes to the individual mandate. Everyone was waiting for Trey Gowdy of South Carolina to start the questioning because, well, it's just that entertaining, and he makes very good points, and here's a here's a chunk of that. What did you mean when you said it was written in a tortured way to make sure the CBO didn't score the mandate as a tax? Well, once again, it was using inappropriate language to try to sound impressive about something to my colleagues. Do you see a trend developing here, Professor Gruber? I don't understand the question. Uh, it's a lot of stupid quotes you've made. That's the trend. A lot of you see them? inexcusable quotes. Yeah. Right. And, and again, your defense is that you're not a politician. The lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. Well, what is a non-politician t- doing talking about political advantages? A non-politician is talking about political advantages to try to make himself seem smarter by conjecturing about something he doesn't really know. So about. you're a professor at MIT and you're worried about not looking smart enough? Yes. Yeah. Well, you succeeded. <laughs> so... <laughs> Patrick, it had to be hard for Jonathan Gruber. You can tell from the videos that uh, keeping the ego in check is not uh, his strong suit, but it was uh, Trey Gowdy. It was Daryl Issa right at the top asking Gruber if he was stupid, uh, on and on and on. Even the Democrats piled on because uh, they're concerned that it gave Republicans talking points, not deceive the American people. So while it didn't get as much media attention as we would have liked because of Martini number 2, uh, it was still a, a pretty good day to show the hypocrisy and, and the really the horrible content of Obamacare. Yeah, it was solid. I, I think um, Trey Gaddy's question about whether an MIT professor is worried about looking smart to his colleagues, I think, is what you define as a leading question, to which the answer is most definitely yes. And uh, I mean, why? I mean, you know, I, as if there, there aren't intellectually insecure Harvard and MIT PhDs out there. I mean, it's like the price of admission. <laughs> Do you expect anything to happen off of this? Uh, A lot of people saying, well, there's a lot of smoke, but ultimately there's not much you can do about this. It's already law. The Supreme Court's already validated it. So even if it did come by deceptive means, uh, you might have a little more political momentum, but ultimately not much changes. What's your take? The hearings might have helped, but the the whole Gruber thing didn't actually get far beyond the conservative bubble, I, I fear. I mean, it was a big thing on Fox. But people didn't really seem to react to it, too. I think because I don't know if this is unfair, but there were a lot of journalists who relied, who talked to Gruber and who talked to Gruber's associates in the healthcare policy world. And they're all left of center. And so there are a lot of people, I think, who trusted these people, these guys as experts and are reluctant now to go after them. As, But I, I think it's helped in a few other places, places where Gruber has been hired. I guess this has thrown a wrench in Vermont's single payer health care plan because Gruber was going to help score that and was being hired for like a half a million bucks a year to do that. So I'm not sure this is going to help us too much in, in taking apart Obamacare, but certainly it's done some discredit to the, the sort of academic health care establishment, maybe. Yeah, well, we'll find out uh, when Republicans take over next year how big of a priority it'll be to either peel back or uh, even do the full repeal. Obviously, that's going to be very hard while Obama's still in office. Uh, on to the bad martini now, and the Gruber story didn't get much attention on networks not named the Fox News Channel anyway yesterday, but it certainly got dwarfed even on Fox once uh, early afternoon rolled around on Tuesday, and the Senate Intelligence Committee, headed by California Democrat Dianne Feinstein, unveiled the so-called torture report. This is largely falling along partisan lines to some extent, although John McCain was highly commending of, of, of the report. Uh, at the same time, though, you have CIA officials, including current ones, appointed by the uh, Obama administration saying this is just not right. We did get important actionable intelligence through some of these enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, they say the report lists more people than were actually subjected to enhanced interrogation techniques. And then if that weren't enough, there's, of course, the fact that Republicans didn't even participate in, in this study. And Bob Kerry, the former Democratic senator from Nebraska who served on the Intelligence Committee while he was in the Senate, wrote for USA Today, and here's just a couple of things that he wrote. 
I do not need to read the report to know that the Democratic staff alone wrote it. The Republicans checked out early when they determined that their counterparts started out with the premise that the CIA was guilty and then worked to prove it. He then briefly described a couple of investigations he was involved in. And he says, in both of these efforts, the committee staff examined documents and interviewed all of the individuals involved. The Senate Intelligence Committee staff chose to interview no one. Their rationale that some officers were under investigation and could not be made available is not persuasive. Most officers were never under investigation. And for those who were, the process ended. Then he goes on to say that there's not even any conclusions here. The worst consequence of a partisan report can be seen in this disturbing fact. It contains no recommendation. This is perhaps the most significant missed opportunity because no one would claim the program was perfect or without its problems. But equally, no one with real experience would claim it was the completely ineffective and superfluous effort this report alleges. So if that's coming from the Democrats, uh, the media is obviously going to carry the water here, Patrick, but uh, it definitely reduces the credibility. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame that so much of the attention that it got yesterday was like, oh, look, you know, here's how long these guys had to stand. You know, here's how long they were deprived of sleep here. You know, five people were fed rectally, you know, and, and that was because it's that that was the kind of stuff that people just like leapt on. But I mean, th- those details weren't even all that new. I, and and so what's what what has been missed is just like this is not a fair investigation. You can't investigate and reach a verdict about someone unless you invest unless you interview the the accused which is what they didn't do in the report they didn't talk to the cia they were just relying on transcripts from from prior testimony yeah it was a hatchet job and like and this isn't inevitable um uh these reports and this isn't a standard as i'm sure sort of carrie was thinking about when the senator house committee set out to do a report they don't start out with conclusion in mind they often reach sort of disputed, you know, they they reach sort of middle of the road conclusions or sort of come to no conclusion or, you know, and and so there's not, this was totally atypical as far as I can tell. What do you think is the motivation here? Is it, uh, as some people say, the giant middle finger coming from the Democrats as they leave the majority? Is it Dianne Feinstein trying to get back at the CIA for uh, bugging Senate offices and that sort of thing? Is it just trying to rehash uh, some of the major controversies of the Bush years? What's at work here? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of maybe this bitterness about the, the, between the Senate Intelligence Committee and the CIA. And I mean, but the thing is, we always go back and forth. Our, our intelligence committees in, on the Hill, are they captives of the CIA? Are they like vindictive and always trying to go against the CIA? It seems like that always goes back and forth. But it seems like it's just a, another way to, to discredit what was done during the Bush administration, which when the Senate Intelligence Committee was being briefed during the Bush administration, they were seen perfectly fine with it. Now that Bush is out of office, they, they just they would like to take another shot at him. I think that's uh, I don't see much else. Could be going on. All right, on to the uh, crazy martini now. And for many, many years, I think 40 years, maybe even more, Ann Compton worked for ABC News at the White House. Uh, if you listen to ABC News Radio at all, she's almost was almost constantly on the top of the hour updates reporting from the White House. She recently retired. She sat down on Q and A on C SPAN with uh, Brian Lamb, and she candidly talked about how President Obama, on at least a couple of occasions, has uh, lashed out at the press. Of course, away from the cameras. I have seen in the last year uh, Barack Obama really angry twice. Both were off the record times. One profanity laced, um, where he thought the press was making too much of scandals that he didn't think were scandals. Another, where he took us to task for not understanding the limits he has with foreign policy and the way he's dealing with the Middle East and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I don't find him apologetic, but I find him willing to stand up to the press and look him in the eye, even though it was off the record, and just give us hell. Does he have a point? From his point of view, he may, but we cover what we are allowed to cover. And when policy decisions and presidents are inaccessible and don't take questions from the press on a regular basis, I think they get what they reap what they sow. A couple of different troubling aspects here, Patrick. Uh, number one, if President Bush or any other Republican president had done that off the record, you can bet it would have gotten out a lot sooner and a lot louder than it's coming out uh, this way with President Obama. Secondly, we cover what we're allowed to cover. Yeah, well, I think she's referring to um, this dissatisfaction on the part of the press that they feel like the White House now has its own avenues for distributing the news. And so, like, they have their own photographers, they have their own YouTube channel, they got their Twitter account. And so they don't get, you know, that the White House is just clamped down on a lot of access. Um, And 
so part of I think the fact that she was that she I mean that really if you sort of read between the lines I mean that's sort of a brutal dissection of Obama and and then she compared him to earlier presidents and like it just he looks way worse and I think that's the press is reacting against what Obama's um, how how the Obama White House has treated the press and and so it's a natural reaction from the press but also a justified one. And so it puts the press in a kind of difficult position here. Uh, it shouldn't, but it does, because on the one hand, uh, as she mentioned and you just mentioned, there's the access issue, which has frustrated the press greatly over the past six years. On the other hand, though, they're largely sympathetic and their natural instinct, at least a lot of these folks, is to carry the water. So it kind of puts them in some conflict here. Yeah, I mean, it's almost kind of a sad thing where it's like they, oh, they just sit there and, you know, and get sworn at. But then and then then they sort of go out and and. Uh, and end up uh, being largely sympathetic. Anyway, I mean, this this scandals that Obama was talking about. I mean, they went out there and they the press largely said, well, you know, they they carried water for him. They said these aren't really scandals for the most part, and they dropped most of them, and they never really followed up on tons of these, especially something like the IRS scandal. And so I don't know. I mean, they she she's saying she's offended. And maybe she was, but uh, it seemed like it certainly worked on some of them. Yeah, not enough to change the way things are covered. Uh, I didn't see. Uh, too much uh, criticism of the president's uh, usual reaction to scandal. Number one, I just read about it in the newspaper, just like all of you, so I couldn't possibly be responsible for it. And on and on to other things, to uh, you know, not a smidgen of corruption and that sort of thing. It's just kind of accepted. And you'd think with the internal bristling they've got going towards this administration for the lack of access, they'd be a little harsher on that. But I guess uh, – some goals are larger than others. There have been moments recently over the past six months, maybe, where as, as Obama's approval rating really starts to, to, to dip and, and a lot of things go wrong. There are, instances, there are instances where the media, you know, just just sort of has to go with public opinion and has to get a little tough on him. So, um, you know, there has there have been a few moments of, uh, of, of, of tough coverage recently, but but that's only once it sort of became uh, – impossible otherwise <laughs> didn't have any other options we'll yeah. see how the uh coverage looks uh, come january when all of capitol hill is controlled by the republicans and the president's at the other end of pennsylvania avenue patrick uh great to have you seven for jim today we'll talk to you later thanks very much greg patrick brennan of national review and for jim garrity today i'm greg Columbus of radio america thanks for being with us today jim and i will be here on thursday for the next three martini lunch